Tschüssi. Okay, good evening. So welcome to this uh, second event in our three times free fintech uh, series. I am uh, Jean Schiltz, director of the Luxembourg School of Finance. Actually, this is a lecture series that the University of Luxembourg is co-organizing with uh, El Hof, so the House of Financial Technologies. Um, at our university, we have actually three research units working in the domain of fintech. First, uh, s &T, who are doing software developments, then our research unit in law, who obviously are treating the regulatory side, and then the Luxembourg School of Finance, and we are working on the financial side. So, in these three times three series, so each of the units has three conferences. It started last month uh, with uh, Jean-Louis Schiltz uh, from the law unit, and now we have the second event today, and the speaker will be Kalerine, who is a research associate at the LSF. He is interested in mutual funds and on the other side on fintech, so he's perfectly suited for Luxembourg. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to give the floor to him and to let him speak. Uh, perhaps just uh, one more word. The next uh, event will be end of January. It will be on the 25th of January, and it will be Dirk Zetschke speaking about uh, regulation, fintech regulation. Okay, Carl, the floor is yours. Thanks. So, basically, my today's presentation will include three parts. So I will first briefly introduce the fintech activities at the Luxembourg School of Finance, and then dig into the two uh, interesting phenomenon, fintech related phenomena which are, have large, a major impact to the financial industry. So fund settlement using blockchain and also robo-advisory. So basically what Luxembourg School of Finance is doing with regards to fintech. So we are planning to introduce two new master programs focusing on finance and technology. So clearly those are a uh, big part of what we are going to do with regards to fintech. The goal of these programs to e educate skilled workforce for the financial market which could be able to work in the intersection of finance, technology and law. And we are basically planning to have two programs, so Master in Finance, Law and Technology and Master in Fintech, both which will start uh, in fall 2018. And I guess the, I mean both the idea is to have interdisciplinary programs, so there will be cooperation with the Faculty of Law or cooperation with the Faculty of Science and Technology and Communication. With regards to public outreach, so we have started this year a seminar series in finance and technology. And basically that series includes interesting academic speakers and also well-known industry speakers to speak on fintech related issues. And also we will arrange annually, like last May we arranged uh, a finance and technology symposium on shadow banking and we are planning to continue this tradition also next year. Lastly but not least for a researcher, we are also doing some research with uh, focusing on finance and technology. So we have basically a uh, group of uh, researchers that are active in finance and technology related topics. So we have a group of 10 people there, four professors and four research associates and some other researchers, including, uh, for example, Young Shields, who is going to give one of the three times three seminar later in next uh, year. And also uh, Sophia Krausel, who will give also three times three seminar next spring. And the current research topic within the, the research, financial research uh, range from digital currencies to robo-advisory or behavioral decision making to collaborative business models. So very broad topics within the large field of fintech. And of course, all of these projects, like most of the, most of the research in finance basically needs empirical data. So if you were, uh, 
uh, willing to cooperate. We, have a, we are very warmly welcome any cooperation with regards to data, any uh, cooperation with regards to ideas or just insights from the industry. So let's go then to the main stuff of the presentation. So first uh, item, basically there is the fund settlement using blockchain. So this graph, I don't know whether you, actually you can actually see it from the uh, reproduced from the Alpha report, basically shows what's the current practice of fund settlement. So basically note there that there are, you have there are many intermediary actors there. You have the distributors which are distributing the fund. You have transfer agents which are registering the fund transactions. You have custodian which is basically safekeeping the assets. And of course when you have many of these intermediary actions and it also it takes one to four days to do the settlement, it's likely that all the processing costly. And this is basically Deloitte and Fund Square report estimate that the cost, annual processing cost of fund distribution for in Luxembourg is 1.3 billion euros. So certainly this is a big issue for Luxembourg and the Luxembourg fund industry. So this graph from the same uh, report basically divides the cost to different parts and certainly uh, like orders, for example, those can be uh, arranged using a blockchain application. Of course, transfers to cash processing would be included to the blockchain. And you might also incorporate, for example, the KYC actions there within the blockchain. So it's clearly there's a lot of uh, potential to save costs with regards to the fund settlement. So the, rep the, the report basically proposed that if you, if you would basically move to a mutualized fund distribution, that would basically mean that you would have a, a common fund depo depository like, like a DTCC in the US, that would save approximately 70% of that 1.3 billion euros. Blockchain is basically an alternative way to achieve maybe even larger cost reductions. And instead of using basically which means to have fun, individual authority there to take care of the settlement, you would have distributed ledger technology. And of course this will have when this, this the large cost of fund settlement and of course are affecting, have large effect on the performance of management companies. So whether this effect is, if you would apply the blockchain and would get those large cost savings, what, do, what would that mean for the mutual fund industry here in Luxembourg? I guess it depends on the competitive situation. So if the mutual fund investors do not care that much about the fees, of course that would be a lot high chances that you could actually just keep the high fees and enjoy higher profits. Of course, if the investors are caring of the, the fees, you need basically to have a high chances of lowering the fees and increase the asset under management and basically increase the aggregate amount of profits. So what the basically what the academic research have been showing whether the fund industry is competitive. So Elton, Cooper, and Pusa put in the Journal of Finance paper studying S&P 500 index funds basically show up that fund investors are not that eager to check what are the actual fees for the funds what they are investing. So actually they find out that investors buy funds which have higher marketing costs than the best performing funds. So it's more the distribution, the marketing which is driving the flows than actual the fees. So in, a, in this sample period, 10% uh, of funds with the highest expenses grow with annual growth rate of 20.5%, 20 20 which is almost double to the funds with the lowest cost. Another paper published in Quarterly Journal of Economics, studying basically the same set of funds, S&P 500 index funds, basically explains this puzzling result by the fact that there are a lot of investors which are basically just know that uh, index funds are cheap, but they don't care about 
checking whether the actual in the index fund I'm investing is the cheap, cheap one. So, and then of course the marketing and distribution are big effect there. So whether this work also, if you take the more recent sample and take active funds, which of course have higher fees than passive index funds. So Michael Halley and his co-authors have a new uh, working paper on this and they show up that this work also, if we take the uh, newer sample, large sample and active funds. And more interestingly, the fee dispersion basically has, has increased during the last 20 years. So investors doesn't seem to be that much concerned about the fees. But is that going to be the case in the future? So that's a big question. So currently, of, uh, for example, Deloitte are basically estimated that Luxembourg and Irish dom Ireland domi domiciled funds are more cost efficient in multiple market distribution. So it seems to be that Luxembourg has been doing very well with, re with regards to other offshore fund domiciles. But of course, whether this is the correct benchmark you know, nowadays in this current, current work. So other academic paper studying the mutual fund visa around the world, published in Review of Financial Studies, basically shows up actually higher fees than the uh, domestic funds. So expense ratios are 10 basis points higher here and expense ratios plus annualized loan loads are 26 to 32 basis points higher. And interestingly, this effect is particularly pronounced for offshore funds sold in high tax countries. So clearly, when you take this account back, it might be that the correct benchmark is actually are whether we are competitive ag against funds which are like a domiciled in their the home countries. So whether we are, whether Luxembourg funds can compete with the German funds, UK funds, US funds. And of course, then you add that the fact that nowadays investors are more and more eager to know the fee structures. There's a big trend on like a discount brokers. People are interested, interested in low fee ETFs and of course, there's a now, there might be a, like a big pressure to favor onshore funds. Just thinking about the world after Brexit and Donald Trump victory. There might be a big uh, reason to favor onshore funds. And of course, tax transparency. At least there might not be any more reason to favor offshore funds. And of course, we should also think about there's a large competition coming from the passive indexing, low fee ETFs. So certainly in the future, we should take care of the fees and to be without having competitive fees, we, the industry has, might have some struggles to be competitive. So second question to notice from this graph is that the settlement takes one to four days. And of course this is true to fact that one big factor there is that in investors orders go through numerous actors before they're actually reaching the asset manager. So this layered structure basically with all of those actors having significant processing time and significant processing cost is leading to have to this low, uh, this so, uh, long settlement period and of course those high, these high costs. So if you would have the same picture for the blockchain, you can say estimate, estimated time of settlement is three to six seconds. That's a, that's a huge difference compared to one to four days. Totally different time frame. And uh, another issue there is that there's, there are no intermediaries in the blockchain. So that of course allows to avoid some costs. So why it takes one to four days? So major obstacle there is that still huge amount of orders are actually execute, executed manually. I was actually shocked to hear that almost 23% of the order volume is actually still handled manually, mainly through fax orders. Being around 30 years old, I don't even know how to use fax. 
So I was thinking about that that's almost like a one fourth of the orders which are still handled using bags. That's, that doesn't seem to be very high tech. And certainly, of course, that increased a lot of the costs. And clearly, and this is actually the, the, also the evidence that transfers and other fund processing uh, transactions, those are even more uh, than the ba basic orders handled manually. So clearly that shows up that there is some room for automatization and to save some cost. Of course, Luxembourg being a uh, domicile which is specialized in cross-border, uh, cross-border lot fund set the complexity of fund settlement, especially if you think about uh, doing transactions outside the EU, outside the EEA area. So that's basically where the, the major complexities arrive. Of course, they so have different time zones that will be make the settlement to be longer because of the delays due to the settlement cutoff times. And also, of course, you, when you have different uh, counterparts in different countries, it's likely that the incompatible IT systems are more frequent. And that will increase the probability of having manual processing of the orders. Of course, you have language barriers, you have different habits regulation to make things even more complex. But that basically just says that having this cross-border uh, dominance here may, makes the, it actually even more important to concentrate to make the, the transactions automatized, the uh, transaction uh, settlement automatized to be competitive against uh, fund domiciles which are mainly operating within the one country. So what is what it matters if you have settlement of one to four days? Of course, that makes that the, the, the settlement risk is higher. It's likely, it's more likely that the customers doesn't have the money after four days. So it might make that there's a high settlement risk. Of course, if the if you basically all the all the time you have money which is not earning the management fee, that makes that uh, actually the management company is losing some fee fee income. I just do like a back of the envelope calculations, which assumes that you have annual inflow of 2%. Just having settlement of one to four days, that costs for the industry 5 million euros annually. Just because of the money is staying there and the settlement and not earning any fee income. And of course, that will also have negative effects on the competitiveness of the mutual funds. So investors certainly, assuming that in average, returns of the mutual funds are positive, they are, uh, they are losing some returns. The last step there is that in the current setup, the orders are aggregated by distributors. And the problem of this is that the fund management company doesn't have all the information with regards to individual orders. So there's a lot of valuable information which is lost in the aggregation. And that loss is information loss is basically leading to fund management company to have less reliable estimates of the fund flows. Of course, that will make that the funds liqu funding liquidity management is less efficient. And that's, of course, especially important during times of market stress or if the fund is investing in illiquid securities. And of course, the basic idea here is that it's much cheaper to, uh, to manage the liquidity beforehand. So if you know beforehand, or you have a good estimate how much your flows are going to be, you don't have to have that much cash in your portfolio. And of course, having a lot of cash in your portfolio, that for precautionary, say, precautionary motives is expensive for the fund performance. And also, if you know that you are going to have a large outflow, you can arrange that you will sell some stuff, more liquid stuff, divide the trades to small trades to have like a lower price impact. And of course, that means that you, don't, you are not exposed to fire sales, so basically very costly for the mutual funds. So basically, I claim that when you, have, you are losing this information, that will cause like adverse effects to fund performance. 
So what the academic literature has been find out about the effect of flows to the mutual fund performance. So Kovalan Stafford in the JFE paper basically show up that mutual funds fires that are extremely costly. An investment strategy that short sell stocks most likely to be subject to widespread flow induced selling and buys ahead of anticipated forced per cases well over 10% annually. And of course this money comes from the pocket of the fund investors. Of course fire sales are not that common, so whether that's true for outside of fire sale times. Roger Edel has a paper which basically shows up that mutual fund performance is highly dependent on the flows what they actually have. So they, you probably can't see, but it basically says here that the, there's a significant negative relation between funds abnormal returns and fund flows. So if you take account the average alpha of the mutual funds, it's minus 1.6% negative statistically significantly. So mutual funds are underperforming. If you take account the negative, uh, if you take ac account the mutual fund flows, the alpha is basically insignificant and around zero. So the flows are basically driving mutual funds to underperform. So this is basically from my own paper. We are basically updating the, taking the account, updating the Edelman's paper by having 20 years of data, big, big data, big sample of uh, mutual funds, basically all the mutual funds from the US, and the result is still there. So funds which have the negative flow uh, have basically have like a high co implicit cost of trading, but also funds which have positive flows might suffer from flow-related costs. So if you, if you have money coming in and you are not prepared, you might actually have some costs with regards to that. And it clearly, the f only the funds which basically have been able to avoid uh, flow-related costs have been able to earn around zero alpha. So according to our estimates, mutual, fund mutual funds costs, uh, uh, trading costs affect market literary alphas and can basically potentially explain the entire observed mutual fund average underperformance. So having good, good estimates on mutual fund flows is certainly important for mutual fund performance and of course that's important for the competitiveness of the mutual funds with to getting flows. Of course now I've been only talking about the adverse effects of flows, but there's also uh, other side when having a good estimate of the flows. It means that if you don't have good, good data to estimate the flows, you can't uh, also uh, be effective selling and advertising your funds. Nowadays it has been the asset managers have been trying to, uh, starting to understand that it's having detailed flow data, detailed distribution data allows to sell and distribute mutual funds much better. So basically what I have in mind here, so you have something like big data kind of analysis on individual investors and distributors and that would allow you to market and sell mutual funds more efficiently, improve distribution strategies and of course make improve the offering range of mutual funds. So the idea is there that when you have that information you can do it both to minimize the adverse effects but also increase the potential positive effects. Another issue there related to the information loss is that the distributors are responsible for KYC operations. So let's compare invest direct investors with di invest direct to the fund. In that case, the fund have the KYC information. But if you have if you have investors which are invest uh, investing through distributors, only the distributor have the KYC information, and that information might be valuable to forecast future uh, future flows. Of course, this assumes that uh, we incorporate that uh, information to the blockchain. So now I've been talking a lot about blockchain and not even explaining what it is. So let's start by explaining what is blockchain. So if you just look at the business press, most 
most of the uh, journalists, uh, most of the newspapers have had a lot of this kind of stuff. What is blockchain? What is blockchain? So, what it is, it's basically the technology behind Bitcoin. The idea there is that you have a peer-to-peer -peer network where all the participants can basically make and verify transactions almost immediately. The idea there is there's no central ledger or central authority to, to verify it. Instead, they, everybody basically have the, the distributed ledgers and basically you have like um, cryptographic exercises to verify the transactions. And it will basically mean that you will have a trustless consensus, so you will have, you can verify the transaction even though every you, uh, participant do not trust each other. Financial Times shows this cl clearly what it actually means. So, there is investor want to send some money, they just, the transaction actually creates a block. The block is there, taken to the blockchain for verification. So the miners do proof of work to verify the transaction. And when the block is verified, it's added to the chain of blocks, the blockchain. And then the basically transaction is executed. So how this works within the mutual funds? So you basically have the asset manager and you have the investor and there's the blockchain connecting them. Of course, all the potential actors are also connecting there, but you don't need to have any intermediary actors there. So basically, just you have like a distributed net of computers which reads the consensus using the some kind of Proof of, proof of work or consensual mechanism to validate the transactions. And the big benefits would be there that the transaction could be approved automatically without the central party to do the authorization there and almost immediately with a lower, low cost. But there is also some drawbacks with regards to blockchain. So one big issue there is that like most of the applications that it's a virtue to, to have fu uh, full transparency. But if you think about financial applications, it might not be that good, uh, good feature to have the full transparency. The idea there is that, for example, mutual fund transactions are valuable information to many other players in the market. So for example, think about like hedge funds or other arbitrageurs, they would want to have that information to be able to front run mutual funds and take some of the profits up for them. So basically, academic research has shown that front running mutual funds are profitable trading strategy. And these, these papers are basically done using the current data sources. So quarterly mutual fund holdings and monthly flows. And even with those quite limited data sets, you can have trade strategies which actually make some profits. Just thinking about blockchain, when you have the data, detailed data on all the inv individual investors, hedge fund would have not big problems to create a profit, uh, trading strategies which actually increase the profitability even further. So, uh, so this is what, what Agorism Deals has been finding about the front-running mutual funds. So in this paper uh, titled, Are Mutual Funds Sitting Ducks? Basically, they show up that uh, it's a profitable for hedge funds to take uh, in advantage of the predictable flow-induced rate of mutual funds. And when you have more flow pressure in the stocks, hedge funds have higher returns and mutual funds have lower returns. Another paper shows basically the same things Front-running mutual fund fire sales is a highly productive trading strategy for uh, institutions which are basically uh, able to do arbitrage. So this paper basically finds out that uh, trading strategy which front run anticipated forward sales by mutual funds earns an alpha of 50 basis points per month. And of course, all this money is out of the pockets of the mutual fund investors. 
to how you could uh, avoid the issue with transparency. So there are certainly the banks are trying to find ways to avoid the confidential information to be shown up to the, all the participants. So the basically the basic question here is how much transparency you need to have to be able to verify the transaction in a blockchain. Of course, one way to limit the, the flow of information is to have a private blockchain where only authorized participants are allowed to see transactions. That helps. But for example, if you think about mutual fund distributors, it's likely that part, some of those distributors are also your competitors. They have their own mutual funds. They, have, they might have their own hedge funds. So and if you would share the information with all of them, you might have the same problems again. And of course, additional side question here is, who would be in charge of the authorization here? Do, would, would you need actually a central party to authorize all these players to get, get into the blockchain? And what would be the fees for this guy? So R3 is basically a consortium of banks and they are proposing following solution. So basically you would have a private blockchain where transactions are verified only contain, basically the tr transactions which would be verified are only contains a limited amount of data. Amount enough to do the verification, but not enough to front run the trades. And of course, in, in addition to this information, the blockchain would have a complete record of the transaction, but that should be visible only for the involve, involved parties. So basically, the asset management company and, for example, the distributor who has been in charge of this actual uh, transaction. So, next problem with, uh, with the blockchain is, of course, that there's a lot of implementation issues there. So you don't have yet clear standards how to implement this kind of blockchain applications. Of course, to have the, the, the blockchain to work, you need to have interoperable uh, back office systems for all of those participants. And that might not be easy, easy task to do, have. The regulation with regards to blockchain is not yet clear. How this would be regulated? What, what there are, of course, there are potential cybersecurity threats. Uh, financial information is highly valuable for many participants, so of course, you have high incentives to hack this information. And it hasn't been able to, nobody has been able to do that nowadays, but you never know in the future. A big issue is, of course, scalability here. Uh, the current Bitcoin blockchain has only hundreds of uh, transactions, like per, per one block. If you think about mutual funds, you would have much, much more. And of course, how to solve these issues, that's a big issue there. So what would be the effect to Luxembourg if, you would, if, you, if the Luxembourg would have the blockchain to solve the mutual fund settlement? Of course, big issue there is what would be the effect to in, uh, employment. So of course, you would uh, cut a lot of manual work there. And of course, you might m some of the intermediary actors might not, might not anymore be needed to actually have the settlement to be done. Of course, in the short term, mid term, it's likely that not all the participants are willing to, act, uh, to uh, take the blockchain and you need to have actually a parallel system. You have the current system and you have the blockchain and they will be working together. So that would basically, of course, increase the need for workforce. And uh, but, uh, I guess bigger issue here is that the change in the required skill set of the employees. You would need to have more technology focused guys there instead of guys willing to, to do the fax work. And of course, in the long term, everything depends on the competitiveness. So where if we can basically, if the Luxembourg can have competitive fees and so certainly we can, the, the asset under management can increase and of course that will have effect on the employment. So to conclude the first part, uh, basically 
I was, uh, I've shown you that the current practice to do fund settlement is costly and it's time consuming. And this is clearly a competitive disadvantage for Luxembourg compared to fund domains which have central depository. And as the basically the competition in fund business is increasing, it's I've the need to be some kind of automatization in the near future and blockchain is one of the potential alternatives. It's not the only one, but it's that's one, one way to solve the issue of automatization in fund settlement. So another big trend, uh, fintech trend that affects the asset management and Luxembourg is robo-advisory. So all the business press has been full of this kind of uh, article showing that the robot advisor is growing fastly. So Bloomberg uh, states that it's like it's to run two trillion by the 2020 if the model is right. But it's not, there are also some dark clouds within the robot advisory. So many standalone robot advisors are struggling. And I will actually explain later on what I think, why I think this is the case. Oh, I shouldn't use tracking and we have like a daughter which is interested in Harry Potter. Uh, so, so what's a robo advisor actually are? So basically robo advisors offer automated investment advisory. You have the like a web based platform, you have mobile platform. It's a basic uh, service that they are offering, they are offering low fees compared to the traditional human-based advisors. And you have automatization of information collection, automatization of all the uh, services you have there. Everything is based on algorithms, computers. Of course, nowadays, most of the few standalone robot advisors are mainly targeting for millennials, so young middle-aged investors, which are tech savvy enough to be able to trust for the robot advisors. And also, they're also targeting for mass affluent uh, uh, and even mass market, basically investors which are not satisfying the wealth limits of traditional advisors. I expect that in the future, you would have basically robot advisors to all segments. It's likely, it's, I actually would expect that the hybrid model will be the more competitive than the standalone model. The big question here is that whether people can actually trust on these robot advisors. And I g that's of course depends how tech savvy you are. So skeptics say people still want to have flesh and, flesh and blood guidance. This is, I guess this is a big question for also for the robot advisors costs. So SaaSwap has a big problem recently when all the robo advisors clients start to call the call center, what to do when the market have big volatility. And of course that will have, they need to have call center, they need to have all the employees to answer the calls. And of course that's totally contradictory to the idea of having robo advisory. So people might not trust enough for computers to allow them to do the, their investment decisions on their behalf. But of course, there are certainly there are a lot of benefits for the investors to have, to basically to, to have robot advisor as their advisor. Of course, the, the most known is probably that the robot advisor fees are much lower than traditional advisors. The Wall Street Journal basically states that human advisor usually have a fee of one to two percent annually. Robot advisor have 25 to 50 basis points, so there's a clear difference, and certainly robot advisors are beating this game. So everywhere in the, there's a lot of things. Low cost advisors are challenging traditional advisors. So why this is the case that they can have lower fees? I claim that it's due to the lower marginal cost per client. And this is due to the automatization. But there are significant economics of scale in robot advisory. It's not add that much to their cost to add uh, new customers using the same platform, same algorithm. But on the other hand, you need to have large initial investments to, to have the model to, to work compared to the traditional 
finance advisory business. This basically means that all the robo-advisors need to have aggressive growth strategy to make sure that they are profitable. Morningstar's analysis basically estimates that robo-advisors need to have between 16 billion and 40 billion in assets under management to break even. So clearly, if you don't have low fees, you can't attract that much of money and you can't be profitable. And of course, that's probably one of the reasons why the standalone robot advisors are currently struggling. I would actually say that, I would uh, give an example why I would say that uh, this is probably a case where the robot advisors are going to win in the end. If you think about, robot advisors are more like a mass production and uh, traditional advisors are more like a craft production. I was thinking about uh, car industry. When Ford introduced automatized mass production, other pro producers need to, to follow. They couldn't compete with the low fees. When you're just thinking about portfolio allocation and optimization, it's not easy to differentiate. The only way to differentiate is probably to show up that I can, uh, I can have a positive alpha. But can you trust that claim? It's probably not that easy. So it's likely that most of the standard standard uh, 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 e uh, low-value-added tasks will be done by computers you know, sometime in the future. But of course, most of the advisors' clients are also needing to have more advanced, more complex services. And these are not that easy to be replaced by robo-advisors. So I would say that the hybrid model when you have combination of robot advisors and human advisors, that will be the probably the, the winning com uh, combination. I was just thinking about having the robot advisor to do your estate planning or tax planning. That, that's not going to do in the near future. And of course, the fees for these high value added services are much higher, so it might be, for the company, it might be also best to focus the valuable man, human capital for the high value added services. So other benefit of robot advisors is that human advisors are known to be exposed to behavioral biases, which are leading them to have costly errors, underperformance. Of course, big question here that all of this like uh, uh, reports on robot advisors that are stating that robot advisors are not exposed to behavioral biases. Nobody has basically tested this, so I, that's only assumption. Of course, it's clear that also the coders of those algorithms have those behavioral biases, but that's actually an interesting question So, to study further in the, in the future. But let's assume that Robot advisors are bias free. So behavioral biases are hurting advisors' performance. So basically, uh, humans have cognitive biases which lead to them make suboptimal decisions. And advisors are also humans, so they also make the same kind of mistakes. So Marco Kaustia and his co-authors basically are study this and basically show up in an experimental setting that finance, uh, financial advisors have all these cognitive biases that are less exposed to those than a standard uh, student out of the university, but they still have it, economically and significantly amount. And that's, the biases are decreasing in the exp experience of the advisor, but they're never going totally away. So what the other findings in the research are that the finance professionals are overconfident. Finance professionals are giving inconsistent advice. These are clear uh, 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 issues which might cause the recommendations given by human advisors to underperform. Even if we uh, skip the uh, 
behavioral stories here. Big issue is that human advisor incentives might not be always aligned with their clients. So certainly clients have tendency to advise clients to what products which are in the best interest of their own. For example, they ha might have in incentives to favor in-house mutual funds which have high fees. They might have incentives to favor structured products. And of course, they might have incentives to advise their clients to trade too much. Combining these two together, human advisor recommendations are likely to underperform. And that's actually what uh, the research find out. So this new first coming paper in the review of finance shows up that uh, financial advice basically leads to uh, underperform in the trades. And it's not the only case. So there's other, other papers showing the same issue. Financial advisors, in case of babysitters. In this paper, they find out that uh, the advice trades underperform. They have lower sharp ratios, so taking account risk, they're, they're also performing badly in that sense. And advice accounts trade too much. So, proper advisors will avoid these kind of issues. But there also might be a harmful effect associated with robo advisors. One big issue there is that robo advisor is likely to increase the correlation of trades. That, mu that might not sound that bad, but I will explain what's the issue there. So, if you have human advisors, it's likely that all the advisors have client-specific preferences but it's likely that the recommendations are have a large cross-sectional variety even within the one advisor firm. The, all the clients of Robo Advisory are basically following the same algorithm. So it's likely that the recommendations are more uh, similar to all the clients within Robo Advisory than with the traditional advisory. And which makes these things even more uh, important is that the timing of trades is likely to be more correlated in case of robo-advisory than in the case of traditional advisory. So in the case of robo-advisory, you probably you either have automatic execution or you get like a message to your mobile phone, execute this trade. You don't need to wait to have a meeting with your advisor. You need, there are no lags in communication. So probably most of the clients are trading executing the trades approximately at the same time. And of course, if the, if the robot advisor's market shares are high, this means that there are a lot of investors which are trading exactly at the same time, same, same, doing the same kind of trade at the same time. A big issue is of course here also that if the white label robot advisor platforms get popular and if most of them are using the same white label la platform, that should have the same effect than having tunnel on robot advisors. So wh what is the effect of correlated trading? I would say that it might lead to underperformance. The idea there is you might have lower returns. One example from the academic liter literature is that a, a phenomenon called alpha decay. So basically, whenever you have a lot of, re a lot of money following same one uh, individual trading strategy. That will basically lead that all the traders who are following the same strategy are competing for the same alpha. And that will lead the alpha to, de to decrease because everybody's competing for the same money. The money cannot just increase because of there are more money following the strategy. And basically this paper shows up that after decimalization, most of the anomalies returns have decreased to half. So whenever you have correlated trading, that will basically following the same kind of stuff that will decrease the profitability. This paper shows the carry trade returns. That's basically a common hedge fund strategy. You know, and how that carry trade returns behave when the hedge fund industry size increase. Clearly, the returns decrease when the size of hedge fund industry increases. 
But also, it's not only about alpha there, it's also that financial assets have limited supply. So the idea there is that when assets have limited supply, when the demand increases, basically if you have a lot of buy demand, the price increase. If everybody is selling, the price decrease. So one of my own papers which basically show up that if there are a lot of traders trading exactly the same time, you might have uh, effects all at the market level. If everybody, is, there's a big enough number of investors who are selling at the same time, market returns would be low. If there are enough traders buying at the same time, market returns would be high. This also works in the case of mutual funds. So if you short mutual funds based on the, the flow correlation, flow correlation meaning how correlated are that individual mutual funds flows with the other mutual funds in the industry. So funds which have the highest correlation in their trades underperform. They basically are buying the same stocks than everybody else and they are selling the same stocks than everybody else. And stocks, uh, the funds which are no correlation with others, they are actually performing quite well. Another issue there is not only affecting the returns available, the correlation there, it's also increasing the risks. So most of the robot advisors are investing to ETFs. So the idea there is that when you have a lot of volumes on ETFs, that actually increasing the volumes of underlying stocks. The ETF trading is actually creating more, vol uh, more volatility there for the underlying stocks and that makes sure that the ETFs are increasing volatility. ETFs are also increasing cope movements. So that basically makes it mean that the benefits of diversification are lower. And of course that will increase the risk of your portfolio. And when you combine these two facts that there's lower returns and higher risks, it might be that uh, robo-advisors having this kind of like a uh, tendency to favor correlated trading might cause actually also them to underperform. Even if they are trading ETFs or other index products. Big issue there is also that nowadays they are introducing an ad additional features to robo-advisors. They have, uh, for example, they are introducing automatic rebalancing. They're introducing tax loss selling. And these might actually be even make the, the problem of correlation even, uh, even larger. Let's think about what happened in the Black Monday in October 87. Basically, you have the, all the traders following the, uh, basically selling at the exactly the same time. And that basically caused the market to crash. When you have basically an algorithm, it might cause the way that if you have a, even a short shock to the market, the algorithm start to sell. And if you have automatic rebalancing, that will make that you will have to, the, the computer say that you need to sell. And when the, that it decrease the price, of course there's a tendency for other algorithms to basically to be triggered to sell. And then you might have a vicious circle of like what we have had a couple of times in the flash crashes. What about then the tax loss selling? It's basically in a paper it looks like quite optimal way to, to avoid some cost related tax, taxes. But on the other hand, if the algorithm says everybody having the same stocks to basically sell the stock exactly the same time, the stock price will basically probably decrease too much and actually they say, the article they say that it's very costly for investors to execute this kind of strategy if everybody is following the same strategy. So to conclude the, the final, the, the last part of my presentation, I basically shown that like a robo I expect that robot advisors are likely to replace humans in easily automatized tasks like like the portfolio allocation, portfolio optimization. But it's basically 
because these are tasks that are so uh, that it's not easy to find ways to differentiate. But there's still need for human advisors for high value added services. So hybrid model is likely to be the one that's going to be the market model to in this this setting. And I hope that the more advanced systems are able to solve the problem with the correlation of trades. I guess that's what I have to say. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer those. <laughs>